Hi, I'm Dr. Rich Roberts. I'm a medical doctor, doctor of biophysics, and for 24 years, I was the president and CEO of a pharmaceutical company. Please join me as we discuss many, many issues involved in bringing in the next generation into your company and eventually transitioning your company on to your, your children. How does one build a business that can last from generation to generation? How do we call it generational business succession? And uh, it's a very, very big treat to have Dr. Rich Roberts, a star who has been on the show before, talking about a variety of subjects. In fact, it brings to mind the uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic uh, a few years ago, he made some um, some predictions on the show, which actually turned out to be spot on. <laughs> Anyone that you can go back on YouTube, you can go back and watch that episode and see what he predicted and what it actually turned out. Again, thank you for joining me here on a, another edition of Mind Your Business, the Nielsen Ratings. The Nielsen is, of course, the global measurement and data analytics company, and they have us once again number three in New York AM radio. How cool is that? And that's because we have great listeners and great guests who make our ratings soar right through the roof. Well, tonight's show. Dr. Roberts, thank you very, very much for carving out of your hectic schedule to join us here once again on Mind Your Business. Thank you for having me. Fire away. Okay. Well, <laughs> you want to go, let's, well, we already mentioned at the beginning about some of those incredible predictions you made back in 2020. So we're not going to visit that. Although we probably should do a show on that. Like, hey, you predicted this. Here's what happened. What were you thinking? Like, how did you, how did you call it so spot on? But hey, that's <laughs> maybe for a different show. Okay. Tonight's show is how does one go about to transition a business from one generation to the next? I, my first question is, perhaps you could take us down memory lane, your story of transitioning your family's business to then when you were CEO. How did that work out? Tell us the story. Okay. The long, long story goes, goes over 24 years. I'll try to, uh, longer than that, I'll try to make it fast. Um, by the way, I, I know later in the show or maybe in a future show, we'll talk about the tax the tax issues yeah. that are involved in, in leaving or passing on a business to the next generation. It's a very, very critical issue. Uh, in my case, it was not a critical issue because when I joined the company, it was on the verge of bankruptcy and it was basically worthless. So there was no no um, lifetime gift tax exemption uh, of any significance that was involved. Um, but anyway, I did not start out in business. As I've told you before, I got my medical degree and also a doctorate in biophysics from the University of Pennsylvania. And um, then I was at Harvard at the Brigham Women's Hospital, where I was an intern in internal medicine. And my father and uncle had started, my father started my uncle, joined you know, a tiny little generic pharmaceutical company about maybe 35 years, 40 years before that. And uh, I was there in Boston, actually I lived in Brookline, but it worked in Boston, you know, at, at, uh, at, at Harvard Medical School. Um, and my father called me and he said, Rich, if you ever wanna try your hand in the business, you better come now because we're about to go out of business. So, I told them, the uh, Marshall Wolf, the head of the House Staff Training Program, I'm going to take a year off, try business, and then decide what I'm going to do. So when I, when I went to the business, I didn't know anything about business. I knew medicine. I knew science. I knew nothing about business. I didn't know what an invoice versus a, a, a bill was. I, I, just, I just didn't know. I didn't know the difference between profit and cash flow. But I knew I didn't know, and I learned. And what I started to see was when I was there, I didn't know how business was done, but it looked like total chaos. I knew how to run um, scientific experiments, writing out, plotting out hundreds of steps and executing them with different you know, scientific devices and, and samples and chemicals and reading results. I knew how to bring all of the different um, functions together for the care of one patient, uh, lab results, radiology, um, radiology results, call on a, you know, a, a cardiologist consult and, and all these things together and always they're changing different results, different tests and, and different status of the patient. I, I knew how to, how to integrate and coordinate all those things towards the one goal of helping a patient, but I didn't know anything about business per se. So to make a long story short, yeah, when I joined the company, it was $35 million in sales. They were probably losing around three to $4 million a year, but they didn't know because they had some kid with a bachelor's degree in accounting running the running all of accounting. And he was just 
he would literally, he would make up numbers mm. because they didn't work. So he couldn't get the numbers to work. So I would make up numbers. And I just, all kinds of craziness going on. So long story short, though, you know, I, I got the company stabilized and turned around that first year uh, and then um, and avoided the bank putting us into workout. And now for the next 20, 23 years after that, it's a, it's a, it's a tale of struggles. Um, and in 1997, even though I brought the company up, 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 until 1996, 1997, we, we crashed because of uh, certain regulatory issues that hit us. And we were on the verge of bankruptcy. The largest hedge fund in the country at the time and one large investor involved. And my uncle and father got bought out of the business. And then I was able to, to run it and within about three to four years back to break even. And in uh, um, 12 years later, we were sold for $800 million plus uh, CBRs, contingent value royalties. There's a lot that happened between those two places. But um, that's much of my story and includes family members, uh, I'll just tell you briefly, like my uncle had his son in the business and one of his daughters in the business, and they were both tearing up the business. Mm. Let's say this for a little later. Yeah. Let's say for a little later. Okay. So now now let's get into some of the key questions that 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 really uh, apply to any business out there because – you know, and, and, and any business at some point, right? The CEOs, the C-suite, they're going to move on. And the question is, what happens with the business? So my question now is, when transitioning a business to the next generation, is it important to keep strategies or processes that were developed over the years in place? Or do they throw them out the window and say, okay, there's a new sheriff in town. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to chart this all out from scratch. Okay. Um, first of all, if the new generation says there's a new sheriff in town, we're going to start from scratch, then you need, you need to remove him from the company immediately because <laughs> it's unlikely that he knows what he's doing, but he may have enough arrogance to think that he does. He might just run it into the ground. And as I'll say probably multiple times in the future, uh, that audience probably can't see, but I can see you laughing out of your seat there, um, that it has to be based on qualifications, capabilities, and credentials and credentials may not be exactly what you think of credentials, but we'll we'll talk about we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, there are two extremes to businesses, right? There's a smaller mom and pop company, you know, guy who has a pizza store, he has a uh, a clothing store, one store, whatever the store is, all the way all the way up to a large, sophisticated corporation, which is you know hopefully what I was able to build um, as as I was able to take over operations and grow it. Uh, in terms of processes and um, controls, they're, they're quite different. In the smaller, like mom and pop business, it's the mom, it's the mom or the pop, the entrepreneur that is, you know, doing most things and and working like a maniac. And you know, how do checks get signed off on to pay bills? He just signs it. Um, in a large corporation, you have uh, different levels of signatures required and even multiple signatures required as it gets to higher and higher amounts of money, mm -hmm. depending on the size of the corporation. So when I first joined our company, you know, I probably had to sign off on a check for $500. But towards the latter part, I wouldn't get involved in anything less than one or $2 million. But, uh, but to make sure that nobody's absconding with money in the meantime, you have process, you know, to control mm -hmm. an accounting, an accounting department and, and they're auditing and all this, those controls in place. So you, you, the controls are, are, are different on a, you know, on the scale of the company. I tell you, for example, you get to the largest like pharma company, largest pharmaceutical companies. We, we, we try to do business with them on, in, in some cases we did with technologies, or whatever for them to make a decision, they had to have um, sign offs from the legal department, the regulatory affairs department, the, the marketing department, the finance, and everyone actually sign off on what on the deal. So that was like the ultimate of controls to the degree where, by, by the way, um, little gets done. And um, that's part of why they, they've not done so so well based on their ability to innovate and, and keep moving. But um, but because but it's, but it's been enough, they've been able to obviously to keep increasing value and also through consolidations, you know, mer through um, uh, uh, purchases and, and uh, consolidations and middle to gain efficiencies that way. But um, the bottom line is, so whatever those processes are, the new kid who comes in had better not just say we're changing everything right away because you're likely going to end up spiraling out of control with a disaster. Well, on the other hand, that doesn't mean that changes don't need to be made. 
It depends on the merit of what wants to be changed. We're speaking with Dr. Rich Roberts, MD, PhD medical doctor, doctor of biophysics, and former pharmaceutical industry CEO for nearly a quarter century. Tonight's show, Generational Business Succession, all about how does a business go from one generation to the next. There's some businesses out there that have been that have been around for decades, some over 100 years. How does that happen? It doesn't happen by accident. And tonight's guest, Dr. Rich Roberts, who, who yes, he transferred, transformed his business from one generation to the next. And that's why we asked him to please carve out some time and join us to, to address the audience on this very critical subject. Again, Dr. Roberts, thank you for joining me here once again on Mind Your Business. Glad to be here. Thank you. Question. Now, and by the way, in the previous segment, you touched on something very important. And of course, and this will even come up throughout the conversation that the new leadership has to be extremely sensitive. If someone's going to come in with even the slightest bit of arrogance, oh, how terrible that will be to the to the moral fabric of the company. And, and in fact, this brings me to my next question. How do you navigate when your morals, values, and leadership skills and styles are different from the previous generation that ran the company? So first of all, before you turn the reins of a business or control of a business, over to the next generation, uh, you better make sure that that person is in the business, is is demonstrating that they have the correct values, the correct correct attitudes um, for the protection of the business, protection of employees, and also protection of themselves. I mean, you could have some next generation comes in who thinks that he can do a bunch of dishonest things and get himself into criminal trouble. Uh, you can you can have someone who comes in and is not at all sensitive to the needs of, of the employees or respectful of the employees, you can get into labor trouble. So you don't turn the reins over to someone until they've demonstrated that for a long time. How long? Oh, I don't know. Um, you know, <laughs> it depends if, if you, if you, you, if you're turning it over because you have to get out for, you know, have a bit of medical reason, then I guess you may not have as long as if you want to just keep going and rock, you know, rocking and rolling yourself and, and have them see how, how they're doing. But you need to be, be careful before you, turn the reins over, make sure that they're proven that they can do it. Now, on the other hand, you can't just assume that the next generation is it, it might be lacking values that the first generation had. In, in my case, uh, it was actually kind of the opposite. I'm the first Orthodox Jew in the family in, in four generations. And there are many things that I simply wouldn't do or ways that I behaved that were radically different than the way it was being run previous to me. And um, I can give you many examples. Yeah, please. They're, the, they're drug wholesalers. Now there's there's only a few large, most, for the most part, a, a few large ones, you know, McKesson, uh, um, Cardinal, Marisource. But, but back then, there used to be about 50 major wholesalers across the country. And when I first joined the company, we were going to the uh, Generic Pharmaceutical Association meeting. I think, I think it was in Puerto Rico. With, and we're going to, you know, we get together all the generic pharmaceutical manufacturers. We were generic at the time, later transitioned into a technology and pharma company, but at the time generic. And um, when I when when and I just taken over as chief operational officer of the company after being there for a few months, again, because, uh, my, you know, my father and uncle could see that I was really the only one who could get things done effectively there. Uh, and also there was there was a. Uh, Oh, I don't know, a uh, power play going on, uh, and, and not for desire for power, but desire to be effective. And I was going to, I was going to, I resigned. I was going to go back to medicine and, and science because of crazy things going on there. And then my uncle decided to fire his son. So then I came back. Um, but um, I, but it's, some things that I fired him, I didn't, I quit because I couldn't take it anymore. And then uh, anyway, but that's, that's a long story. But anyway, so going to the first, um, a wholesaler, a pharmaceutical wholesaler conference in my tenure at the company, we couldn't get anybody to meet us. No one would go out with us for a meal. Nobody would meet with us. And our company had a reputation as being a dishonest company mm. throughout the industry. Mm. A year later, when we got, went back to the meeting, a year after, after I had been in charge, uh, we were booked day and night with meetings with people because we decided to start doing things honestly and tell the truth. I tell people, I have a radical approach to business. We tell the truth. Um, 
<laughs> how sad, how sad. Radical approach yeah, right. to business. But anyway, also, we're talking about morals, ethics. You know, when I joined the company, there were multiple gender discrimination lawsuits against the company. Mm. And what would happen is people would come up to me and they would, they would say, they would say off color jokes and I wouldn't respond to the jokes. I would just move on to the, the topic that, that had to be addressed. And then they sometimes use curse words. I would respond as though I didn't hear the curse word. And I certainly would never use a curse word myself. And then that tended to be a, an, a, an ethic or a value values that, that when you're president and CEO, they look to you. I mean, I, this is something I learned on the job, but they, they look to you. And, and from a, like from a psychiatric perspective, there's even some you know transference going on. They see you in a, in a parental figure. So you set that tone. So um, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that uh, it's not always that the next generation has lower, va- lesser or worse values than the first generation. It could be the opposite also. Um, now, as part, as, as part of this answer, you had touched on that, that there's, there needs to be a time period of this transition. Now, of course, if God forbid it's because of a medical issue, then you can't control it. That can't be controlled. But when it can be controlled... And, and as you mentioned, the time frame is you know is is subjective. But is it fair to say that it needs to be at least a minimum of twenty four months, twenty four to thirty six months? I don't think that there's any rule of thumb. Uh, something I, I would probably mention later, depending on how the discussion goes. But it really depends on the value on the on the talent and capability demonstrated by the next generation. I mean, in my case, which I'm not saying is typical. But it, it was it became, it became clear to um, not only the family but also the uh, the members of, of management in the company who were the few that were left who had any significant capabilities that I was the one who could get things done and I was the one who wouldn't uh, allow chaotic situations to go on people to be undermined I, again I could give you story after story after story so uh, and after only three months I said I, I said I'm going back to medicine unless you make me COO, which by the way, when I joined the company a few months earlier, I'd never heard of a COO, but I, <laughs> there was a guy named Greg Smith. He was the, 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 the director of marketing. He had an MBA and he taught me about, uh, you know, the, the, the few that were left that had management capability, they were like whispering to, into my ear, like what's going on to try to bring me up to mm-hmm. speed. By the way, there's no internet back then, so I didn't, you know, wouldn't be able to just go learn. Right, that and Google need. something like, all right, see, right, someone says an invoice. We have to create an invoice. Oh, what's an invoice? Let me go to Google. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, in this case, GPT four, but that's another that's story. Right. So, um, so I, I don't know that there's a rule of thumb, okay. but you need to make you need to make sure before you turn the reins over that this person can do it. And by the way, you could do it in stages. You can have that person be the director of a department. Then a vice president of a department and see how they perform. And you, and if you're if you're really uh, a good leader of your company, you'll have contacts all throughout the employee structure, not just management structure, the structure, but also the hourly employees, and they'll feed back to you quietly what's really going on behind the scenes. Now here's a uh, a question which is of course so much more relevant in today's day and age with the rapid pace of technology and today with AI is there a specific approach when a business drastically changes from generation to generation and that is the approach of the business so for example if let's say you take a brick and mortar operation and now it's becoming a uh, online how do you preserve the brand when the marketplace has changed in a way that does that that it just doesn't jive with the previous generation, meaning that there's there's a shift around the same time that there's a tech, a major technology shift. There's also a transition from generation to generation. It's a loaded question, but I figured if there's anyone I could ask, I could ask you. <laughs> so generally, the second generation, in other words, you have the entrepreneur and then the second generation. Yeah. Generally, the second generation is not nearly as capable as the entrepreneur. The entre- I mean, just forget genetics, but just to be an entrepreneur, to be able to, to um, create and weather the storms and to build something is a, is a pretty rare talent. A lot of people think like, oh, if only I could own my own business. Oh, man, get ready for stress day and night, threats from everywhere, problems, issues. So... Um, you know, that entrepreneur had that capability and built that business up. 
generally the second generation doesn't, but they might. And the second generation might be better and smarter, or at least at least you know similarly capable. And that's what that's what you really need to assess. But um, in terms of change to the business, um, change is not good, and change is not bad. It depends what the change is and what the merits are of the change. So uh, just uh, some examples of my own experience, not about next generation, but I remember once one of my, uh, at the time, my senior vice president of operations who had maybe, I don't know, maybe 400 people reporting to him and, and they're doing the entire manufacturing operation, manufacturing about 2 billion tablets and capsules a year. I once asked him, I said, why do we do this process this way and not that way? And he said, because that's the way we all that, because that's the way we always did it. I went, Bing, I'm going to terminate him. I'm going to sever him from the company at some point um, because he can't be forward thinking. Uh, now, if he says, well, we've looked at these and the, these are the four other technologies available. We've evaluated them. Here's the analysis. Here's why what I'm doing now is better than them. Great, fine. Brick and mortar. If you got a bookstore you know, uh, and and all of a sudden Amazon's coming online, and you say that's the way we've always done it, uh, we're not changing. So now you're headed towards disaster, towards catastrophe. So you need to, you know, the, someone who won't change is in almost all cases doomed. You'll find a case or two. Is it, you know, some company is a tiny little again single person, two person company. He's a craftsman, knows how to do this little niche or that. But for the most part, no, if they won't change, they're, they're, they're doomed. Uh, because why? I mean, ha we have so much improvement in wealth in this country. I mean, I'm not talking about wealthy people, I'm talking about the increase in wealth in the country. I mean, if someone doesn't have a car now, they think they're poor. If someone doesn't have an air conditioner, they think they're poor. Like what? It never used to be that way. There's been a tremendous increase in wealth in the, in the country because there's been so much advancement in technology that's enabled people to produce more and more and more, making things less costly and more accessible to the public. So things for the most generally will change and get better and, and, and bigger, but we need to analyze every one of those changes. I can tell you at one point in the Please. generic pharmaceutical industry, our competition, uh, generic pharmaceuticals are the ultimate commodity. Yeah, in other words, when it comes to oil, I guess you have some some heavy oil, some lighter oil. Uh, you might have wheat. I, got, I don't even know wheat, but maybe thicker kernels, lesser. Yeah, but when it comes to generic pharmaceuticals, each your ibuprofen has to be made to the exact same FDA specifications that are in your application that are equivalent to the brand. And not only can you not make it any better than the brand, you, it's illegal to state that it's better than anybody else's. So you ultimately end up selling on price and service. Good companies get their service, their production schedules, uh, you know, production capacity tuned, fine tuned. So then going on price goes down and down and down. So then we saw that our, so then I, I heard from our vice presidents or directors who had gone to India and China to, uh, to source pharmaceutical raw materials. By the way, a big topic now about bringing those things back into yeah. the country because of the exposure. And they said to me, said, you know, they, I kept hearing Rich, um, this generic uh, manufacturing competitor, that generic manufacturing competitor, they're working on opening factories in India. And they're Indian companies now, manufacturers of the finished product, tablets and capsules, that are working on applications to sell with the United States. So our price structure, I mean, they were in India, they were, they were at the time paying their employees about $50, $50 a month. Um, we and and you know uh, labor laws ah forget it environmental laws ah forget it um, so there was no way we could p compete I saw that we were able to crack the patent on a large branded pharmaceutical product that brought us in a, a couple hundred million dollars and was able to use that money to then bring in physicians and scientists which I led uh, to develop new products and work on new technologies um, to enable us to transition. To, to becoming a, a pharma company. But so it does, some transitions are good and some are not. And a substantial part of your success or failure as a CEO is going to be your ability to accurately determine that.
And thank you for sharing that story about the uh, potential, I don't want to say competition from India, but just like the, the again, that train was coming down the track. Some CEOs would say, nah, it's not going to work out for them. The FDA is not going to let them. And, and they're just going to be in denial, have their head in the sand, and just like, you know, it's, it's, I, I'm, you know I'm, I'm putting it out of mind because, you know, I, nothing I could do about it. And exactly. If I just give a couple of quick examples. Please, of- please. In business schools, which I've never been to, I guess or maybe I've been to the ultimate business school <laughs> in a sense, right? The school of hard knocks. Hard knocks. Uh, but a classic case is buggy whips, right? If you when you had buggies, you would use to whip the bu- the whip the horse to make them go faster. <laughs> well, here comes the car. If you don't see that the car is coming and it's gaining traction, uh, you're in trouble. If you're sticking to buggy whips, like today, you could see if the uh, gasoline engines. If you don't see the electrification coming, but they do, they all do, right? Because they're big, sophisticated companies that make sure they make those transitions. Um, Xerox, Kodak, uh, all those, you know, or, or Polaroid, they're all examples that, of, of companies that wouldn't make the change and got crushed. Again, you need to analyze the change. But if you look at, you, you ask me, if I could have a camera that can take, um, you know, uh, 1,000 pictures on it and it doesn't cost me anything because it's electronically on a memory, Versus having to put a roll of film in, get 24 shots, and send it <laughs> off to be developed. I, you say, uh, well, yeah, <laughs> I think we got a problem. But some of these companies apparently didn't do so, and they got crushed. So you have to you have to be smart and analyze, and that's where a CEO um, makes or fails to justify his salary. Tonight's show titled "Generational Business Succession," and that title itself gives it away. How does one transfer? How does one make sure, ensure that the business will survive from one generation to the next? And we have none other than Dr. Rich Roberts, MD, PhD, medical doctor, doctor of biophysics, and former pharmaceutical industry CEO for 24 years, URL Pharma. And um, in the first few segments of tonight's show, Dr. Roberts shared a wealth of information about uh, also, you know, not just transferring one uh, the business from one generation to the next, but even just good advice as far as running a company, dealing with challenges, and making sure to see what's around the bend. Don't have your head in the sand. Um, we now turn to a very delicate part of transferring a business from one generation to the next. This is really a loaded one, Dr. Roberts. And how does a new generation of leaders coming in handle the delicate nature that they are now becoming bosses over over a team over employees that 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 maybe weren't even born when they joined the company I mean you have you may have let's say you have a company that's 50 years old okay and and there's someone who's been on the team since 1993 okay so they're on for 30 years and then uh, let's say the new leader comes in and is 40 years old, was 10 years old when this employee joined the company. <laughs> I mean, that we can't ignore that there's, a, there's, there's, there's something in the room. There's, there, there, it's a very delicate nature. How does a company go about that? There, what, what you bring up is a very, very astute question, and it's, it's really critical. Now, you have to look at sort of two sets of employees. When you're looking at hourly employees and people on sort of the lower end of the salary employee group, lower management group, their main concerns generally are job security, pay, and respect. And that's critical because you might have a new kid comes in and, again, he thinks that because he's the son of the boss or he's the owner, he can now treat people disrespectfully, which, by the way, just shows a defect or deficiency in that person's value system or that person's personality that they feel that they need to show this dominance over people, uh, which is uh, just a terrible way to, to treat people. But job security, pay, and respect are generally what so the hourly workers will be concerned about and lower management. Mm-hmm. But middle to upper management is also going to be concerned about advancement, the opportunity for career advancement. And for them to see that the the uh, dynamic, um, smart, capable, dedicated entrepreneur that started this company has now turned it over to his flunky son. I say son, it could be a daughter, it doesn't matter. It, but it, it, there's flunky child who is now tearing the place up 
and you know laughing all the time and making a big joke out of everything and and making uh, decisions on a whim and, and student body left student body right um, this will make them uh, you know feel that th this the, the stability of the company is poor and also like I was looking to become vice president or senior vice president depends how big mm -hmm. the company is mm -hmm. and and now they put this flunky in as president uh as, are there other flunky relatives going to come in as as vice presidents underneath him and is this the end of my job advancement so <clears throat> I, I, I guess it goes back to kind of what i said before that you you as the business leader better make sure that if your child comes in that this next generation comes in that this ne next generation has proven himself yeah, when I say himself, himself, herself doesn't make a difference, but uh, has proven himself. Um, and one way to do that is have them work up through the ranks and make sure that they actually perform at each stage in the right. No, they don't have to go on the same 20 year career path as someone who's not not going to be the, is not the next generation to take over the company. But if you just put them right at the top, that's a big mistake. Big, big mistake. Now, um, to hold on to this question and even to make it more, as a you know, as the word goes, tichtig, more finessed, is that the new leader comes in and and needs to be needs to show an extra degree of respect, care, and concern because of the fact that there's a nepotism effect that's in the room, and no one could. You know, he can't. Not that he can't deny it, but that it's it's just there. It's the elephant in the room. Yet at the same time, like in your case, the especially if the company needs to be turned around, it needs an executive. It needs someone to make tough decisions. But at the same time, they got to be an extreme mensch. Yes, you're so right with your your observation. You're so exactly hundred percent laser accurate on the target on this. When I first joined the company, again, there was not effective management. The place was in a state of chaos. And when I when I became COO, I started our first meet our first meeting of the management, which I had um, multiple days a week. And all the notes of the meeting would, would be published so everybody would know what, what what everyone's responsibilities are, which was never done before. And I would say, okay, well now we're gonna we're I'm new to the company. We're going to, I had, I had the heads of all the different departments there. We're going to start out with listing the topics of, of what we need to talk about, just the topics, no details. Okay, we have the, the warehouse has uh, um, inventory expiring because it's not being rotated. Um, our marketing campaigns, we're getting the advertisements out a week after the marketing campaign period has ended, which is crazy. Then someone would say, Oh, so we need to get a better photocopying machine to do the marketing material. Someone says, we got to get someone who's going to run that machine. I said, stop talking. Stop. And they're like, what? I said, stop talking. I said, we're listing the topics. We're not doing the details yet. The topics are going to be Roman numerals in, in, in the outline. And then we're going to go through each one and pick it apart. So stick strictly to the topics. So after that meeting, it, got, it came back to me that a couple of members of management, including uh, one or two of the family members, of, you know, were not so capable, let's say, um, uh, were, think, were considering leaving the company because of the way they were treated. So I, I said, you know, the company is, is a democracy. If you don't like it, you can vote with your feet. Um, <laughs> and by the way, nobody left. And we got things organized, we got things done. So yeah, no, you, we, when you come in, it depends on the situation. So I came into a disaster. But if you're coming into a company which is running well, doing well, it's grown over the last 10, 20, 30, 40 X years, whatever it is, if you're in the present CEO, the more you humble yourself and respect people, the greater you're going to be to them. Because mm -hmm. they already know the power structure. They all know it. Everyone knows it. And that you're treating them nicely and as a good human being, which you should do anyway, in any case, in any circumstance, uh, is is just all that more powerful. Now, in the preparation for the show, you had outlined five key points that the new generation must factor in. It's very beautiful. It's uh, I think it's five E. The the new generation po pointers 
that they must be cognizant of? Yes. Number one, the new generation better be capable. Again, if you're going to put in your, your funky son who, who can't get it done and is disorganized and, and whatever the, the bad qualities are, um, isn't smart, doesn't understand, uh, you, you can't do that. You're going you're gonna to lose the company eventually. It, it's going to spiral out of control. It must be capable. Um, you also have to have the next generation, as I said, has, has to show respect to everybody. I know like me as president and CEO, and it turned the company around. Everybody knew, knew me, of course. When when I was walking through the hallway of one of the manufacturing areas, the 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 the, the bell went, the siren, whatever you call it, went off. It was the end of the lunch break. All the hourly workers who run like the tablet machine were walking down the hallway. I held the door open for them. Now, none of them wanted to walk through it. I said, no, please, please go through. <laughs> they wouldn't walk through it. Okay. Message delivered. Right. Message right. delivered. And by the way, I didn't do it to deliver a message. I deliver. I did it because I respect them. They're good human beings. They're working for a living. They're trying to support their families. I mean, they're totally deserving of full respect. I don't. So they have to be respectful. Third, you need the next generation to work harder than anybody else. I, we had, at one point we had 800 employees with a contract sales force. I worked harder than anybody else. Everybody saw it. I, I worked at a maniacal pace day and night. I would, uh, multiple things happening at the same time, and all day long, all day long, morning, noon, and night. Uh, everyone saw that. You have, to, you have to demonstrate, you have, you have to lead by example, demonstrate that you work harder. Also, demonstrate talent. Um, you know, as, a, as I would say, is uh, the, the next generation has to be highly credentialed. Now, um, credential doesn't necessarily mean, um, they have a medical degree or a doctorate like I do. Okay. Credentialed means they, they've shown the ability to work hard and to build and be successful and to lead at different stages through where, you know, depends how old they are, what other things they've done, which is why, which is why, so that's the credentials. But to put in there again, some flunky who has no credentials, never did anything, and now he's the big boss, he could tell me what to do. <laughs> mistake you can't do it they'll tear up the company um and what will happen is if you do this if you put in somebody next generation who isn't up to snuff and it and doesn't make the right decisions who listens to gossip and doesn't know how to check, fact check things and and and, and does all these other what will happen is you'll find that the people that are the most talented the most capable in your company will leave for other jobs because headhunters are calling them, you know, talent recruiters, whatever you want, are, are calling them all the time. And and what you'll be left with is the one who couldn't get other jobs. And that's, it'll be a drain of talent in your company. And that's, a, again, a big warning sign. Here's an, uh, an interesting question. Now, of course, there isn't one size fits all in any situation. It's like, I remember in one of the previous interviews, I said, you know, like, uh, you know, if someone came over to you, Dr. Roberts, and said, you know, can you share with me what's the number one tip in business? And I remember your answer was something like, the number one tip is you don't understand a thing about business because there is no number one tip in business. It's a lot more complicated than that. My question now is, is there any type of general advice or suggestion when a company has made the decision that they are going to hand it over to the next generation? Um, should they make an announcement about it? What should kind of the internal communication, external communication, any tips regarding that so that people are not just like, oh, it's a big surprise, a big shock? The way that I communicated with all the employees back when I was running the company, uh, I guess it changed as you know, technology came in and technology advanced. So how you communicate with the employees now, uh, whatever mode you use, it should go out to all the employees. Now, in addition to my hanging memos behind a glass window, keep them informed every step along the way. I also would hold every three months, I tried to, by the way, I didn't always keep to it because I was just so overwhelmed with work, but I tried to have meetings with all the employees. At first it was like two or three meetings and it became, I had to have five meetings on the same topic because you had different shifts and different locations. Um, and but yeah, it could be a couple hundred people in the meeting. You know, 150, 200, 250, 300 in the meeting. Give them lunch, and I would just and I would do a, 
you know, on a, on a uh, screen, do a mm-hmm. presentation and tell them what's going on. And I told them the bad stuff too. I told them the threats. I told them, you know, um, and people appreciated that they were being told the truth. So yeah, that's how we communicate. And you obviously want to communicate the next generation, but I, but I strongly suggest that next generation come in and work their way up and, and, and become um, to a large degree, the obvious choice. They may not be the absolute most talented person in the company, but they need to be, they've seen that like, oh, this is the boss's son. This guy's smart. This guy works hard. This guy works well with others. This guy's very positive. Um, and they see that, they kind of know the trajectory. So it's not going to be a surprise to anybody. Um, and I do want to say something else about, about putting your child in the company, yeah, you know, or, or other relatives in the company. It's very dangerous in terms of relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we talked about how long a child should be proving himself before he gets to be president and CEO. Well, it, it's going to vary, but it may be too long. The child is resenting you. It may be too short and then you're and then the child is not ready for that for that transition uh, there could be other relatives there might be sibling rivalry in the company if you have multiple children in there and you know why why is it that this one got to be president and i'm stuck down here uh, and then you never want anybody to struggle in the company and i want to tell you that when i <clears throat> as i told you when my cousin was terminated from the company um, that was when I told my uncle that I had I was resigning, and it was clear that I was the only member of the Roberts family who could get, who could get, who could get anything done. So he asked me, "Now that you no longer are part of the company, what should, what's the first thing I should do?" And I said, "You should terminate your son." And I said, "But the problem is <laughs> ready for this." I said, but "The problem is not the son, your son. The problem is you." I said, "Rugby, when rugby, which is a company in our industry." grew to be literally like 30 times the size of our company. Why? Because when the entrepreneur, when the founder's son came in and was, you know, and was a flunky, the guy fired his son. And Goldline was another large company that was maybe uh, 15 times our size. What happened when his son came in and was using money to buy race horses and fancy cars, the entrepreneur fired his son. So the problem is you, because you're not willing to do the tough things to make the tough decisions that have to be done to be successful. Then he said to me, Michael said, okay, from this point forward, my son never steps foot in the company again. Will you come back? Wow. The answer was yes. What's fascinating about that is that he was so self-aware to on the spot make that because we can't ignore there were clearly emotions at play here. Well, again, I was a medical doctor and doctor of biophysics. I said, I, I said, I'm going to go back to internal medicine. I'll go back to Harvard. I don't, I don't need this job. Um, um, and but when you're talking about professionals who are capable in other areas of business or whatever it would be, they also generally don't need that job. Now, maybe computer programs right programmers right now need jobs because you know they're being laid off in large numbers in in Silicon Valley. Valley. But you know, the, the professionals generally who are very capable, they don't need the job. So um, I was able to to pursue that path because I was just going to go back to medicine science. Wow. There's uh, actually only around two minutes left to the show. So just to hold on to this last point, uh, any any tips? I mean, it's, it's it's really unfair. It's kind of a, lo- <laughs> it's a loaded question like all of them have been. But just tips in general, working with family, a spouse, a child, a parent, any any – it's not fair to do this in two minutes, but. <laughs> well, I mean, the first tip is don't do it. Uh, you know. <laughs> I mean, I heard some guy is in business with his wife and they have a great relationship. I thought, well, that's amazing. Uh, you know, there's there's so many stresses. There's so many complications. And hey, if they're they're working together and it's working great, that's fantastic. But the risks are huge. Having a child in the business, you know, the child wants to wants to grow up. You know, let's say the child is now 35 years old and you're still making the decision. The child feels, uh, you know, undermined or emasculated uh, and wants to be a grown up. Well, you're not ready to, to, to uh, go off into the sunset. So, it, you know, it's it's better not to put a relative into the business if you can help it. Um, and, and, and and especially if they're not not so capable. But um, people do it. And sometimes it works. Um, and I, I tell you, as Orthodox Jews, 
there's a, a very strong a, a strong attitude or value that children have from when they're about two years old all the time going of of keep it other aim respecting honoring respecting and honoring your mother and father the kids don't have the the kind of a resentment towards their parents for the most part i must ignore individuals for the most part don't have the kind of resentment towards the parents you'll see in the secular world they don't have the kind of anger towards the parents that you'll see in the secular world they value their parents and value their grandparents value the elders so it, that is that stands a, a better chance than general um and there are plenty of cases where the next generation came in worked together great and did great but um there's there's the stakes are high because you could end up destroying the relationships that are really the most valuable things uh, that you have in this world is relationships with your family. What an incredible show. And this, there is actually a, a many, many more points that we really can get to. And uh, Bez Hashem, we will have uh, future shows together with Dr. Roberts. Dr. Roberts, a uh, medical doctor, PhD, uh, doctor of biophysics and former pharmaceutical industry CEO for over, uh, for nearly, for nearly uh, a quarter of a century. Tonight's show, Generational Business Succession, how to transfer the a business, a successful business from one generation to the next. Well, this wraps up an incredible edition of Mind Your Business. Tune in again next Sunday night for another great edition of Mind Your Business right here on 710 WOR, The Voice of New York. Have a successful week. Thank you for watching and make sure to subscribe to this channel and be notified every single time a new video goes live. Don't miss out on any of the weekly interviews that I have with top business leaders, sometimes Fortune 500 executives. Hit subscribe and turn on notifications.